What if you became a cowboy for one day? There's a funny thing about the American mentality. Guys are able to turn even small and not too significant events into a legend. The culture of North America is proud of everything that is more important than making money from it. That's why stories about cowboys have collected billions of dollars at the box office of movies, earned the same amount by releasing games. Costumes and paraphernalia have been sold in so many quantities you can't even count them. At the same time, cowboy stories have gotten about as far away from reality as a child's rocket designer from going to Mars. In the next few minutes, we will introduce you to the real story of an ordinary U.S. cowboy. This will help illustrate that even the most ordinary cowboy, like Trent Alexander Arnold of Texas, can become a legend. The action takes place in 1867. Our hero is watching bulls in the middle of a ranch near the city of Austin, in the south of the modern USA. The cowboy costume is perhaps the only thing that games and movies have conveyed perfectly. However, the whole costume, from leather pants to a wide-brimmed hat, is shabby, just like Alexander Arnold himself. He is 48 years old, 16 of which he spent in war. First it was the war for Texas's independence from Mexico in 1835. The current part of the United States belonged to its southern neighbor. Within a year of hostilities, which Alexander miraculously survived, Texas became independent. However, fighting continued until 1845. On December 29th of that year, the U.S. annexed Texas, making it a part of itself. Because of this decision, our poor Alexander became part of another war, the famous civil war between the North and South of the United States. It lasted four years from 1861-65 and ended with the defeat of the South, which included Texas. However, everyone won, because slavery was abolished, and President Andrew Johnson proclaimed the reconstruction of the South in order to make the United States an economic monster. Railroads were built, reforms were made, and life seemed to be getting better. But for Alexander and working men like him, who had spent their entire lives at war, veterans trivialized what to do. That's where the business that would usher in the golden era of cowboying enters the scene, and we'll tell you about it with trend. A year ago, while wandering idly through a bar, Alexander Arnold met a farmer named Jurgen Klopp. Jürgen complained a lot about the hard life with bulls, cows and other horned cattle in Texas. Commercial raising of animals there is extremely difficult bulls run away, neighbors steal parts of the herd, and prices are low at the cattle market. However, rumor has it that in wealthy eastern cities like New York and Philadelphia, they are willing to pay millions for beef. But the trouble is, the nearest railroad is a thousand miles from Austin, and it is almost impossible to get a herd to it. Our Trent scratched his head and offered the farmer his idea, to keep track of the cattle, brand them, and, time after time, drive them to the station and sell them to the east. Jürgen thought for a moment and agreed. So did thousands of other farmers who began, in 1866, the cowboy era. Our Trent's day is a chore. Wake up in the barn, lie on the hay, stretch a stiff back, get dressed and hurry to the barrels. First to drive around, to check where the muscular animals have broken through the fences. Then to find and bring the runaways home, and then to make sure everyone had a good meal. But that's just the beginning. 
For later, broken fences must be repaired, newborns must be branded, for no matter how you look at it, some of the steers manage to escape and mingle with other people's herds. Yes, cattle theft was common, and every farmer had his cowboy brand the bulls to avoid confusion and strife. Sorting out the thousands of different brandings was a real science, akin to medieval heraldry, where librarians studied the family crests of various families. Our Trent had to master this art to survive. Recently, Alexander Arnold, together with his associates, organized the traditional annual corral and division of cattle. The essence of it was simple. All nearby herds were driven out into the field, and cowboys, following the branding, knocked the bulls together. However, in reality it was not easy to maneuver among hundreds and thousands of furious two-ton animals. This is where the traditional rodeos you may have heard of began. Cowboys would lasso the bulls, take them down, ride around barrels, and sometimes even jump into the saddle. All of this turned into a competition that was made permanent in 1883. And to this day in the bars of the United States are rides in the form of bulls, on which you need to hold on. All thanks to the fact that for 20 years cowboys like Trent survived as best they could. Ranch work, as it turned out, wasn't so sweet. Alexander Arnold had some tough challenges ahead of him. Jurgen Klopp recently found a buyer for the bulls in Chicago. Even now, however, to travel the thousand and fifteen hundred miles between Austin and Chicago seems to many to be a problem. In 1867 such a task seemed almost impossible for our Trent, which was a thousand miles from C, Missouri, and there was a railroad station there. That was usually where the sale was made and the satisfied buyers sent their new cattle home in trains. To move a couple hundred bulls a thousand miles north is only a small matter. Our Trent had accomplished this task many times before, as had thousands of other cowboys. Several major hauling routes were known, such as the Dola Run, the Great Western Run, the Chisholm Run, and many others. The mechanism was always the same. Jurgen Klopp would supply our Trent with money and hire a couple other cowboys to help with the hauling. Unlike in the movies, where cowboys often look like rich men, they actually made pennies. Few could afford a horse. It was much more profitable to rent horses at special stations, because you had to move fast, and such a pace for horses was fraught with fatal consequences. Moving across the desolate prairie, Trent and his companions surrounded the herd in a ring, making sure that not a single cow fought back. Here we encounter the second stereotype, guns. Cowboys were not great marksmen, and the common revolver was owned by every third man. For a simple reason there was often no need to shoot. The movie depicts epic battles of cowboys with bandits and Indians, but in reality such clashes were rare, mostly with bandits. Indians are not worth mentioning. Movies, books and games are blatantly lying. By the time the cowboys showed up in 1866, the Indians had long since been driven far west. There were, of course, occasional skirmishes on the western passes, but they could be counted on one's fingers. For the Indians were by then a sorry sight. Remembering the Indians, the cowboys saw how they huddled together in small villages and seemed not enemies but miserable starving people. 
This case is described in Olson Alfred's book, and is also supported by evidence that the cowboys themselves often shared provisions with the Indians. Here we get into the ground of the legendary code. Our Trent, like any self-respecting member of the profession, strictly observed unofficial laws. One of them was that a cowboy always helped those in need, despite his own poverty. A cowboy was forbidden to complain, as this was the lot of the weak. Also a cowboy had to be brave, modest and silent. And horses were a separate story. After a hard day, a cowboy had to feed his horse first and then take care of himself. Horse thieves were hanged without hesitation. Riding another man's horse was considered a tougher crime than sleeping with another man's wife. But that wasn't all the rules Trent and his comrades followed on the long cattle drive. The trademark cowboy nod and touching of the hat was not a special form of greeting, but a normal precaution. A cowboy was forbidden to wave or talk unnecessarily so as not to frighten the horses. Also, when approaching another cowboy, Trent always gave a calm tone of warning so as not to frighten the rider ahead. Looking back was forbidden, as it could be confusing and a sign of distrust. Following all these rules, Trent and his cowboys drove the herds on. At night, an interesting process began to keep the herd from scattering, the cowboys constantly patrolled the perimeter, checking on each other and echoing through verses of Kafka songs. The song would start on one side of the perimeter and end after coming full circle. This gave birth to cowboy songs, ballads and a whole genre of music that is still alive today. The cowboys, I regret to say, slept for three hours at best, and after three weeks of exhausting travel they looked pathetic. It's hard to blame the guys for taking the money they received and going on a bender. The cowboy code even obliged them to shoot in the air and yell when they left town after drinking. So the boys were paying tribute for the welcome, which was not always so. For dozens of cowboys after a grueling transition often went to pieces, and some towns even hired bandits as guards. There are thousands of stories of Texas cowboys returning home after a money haul and going on a rampage, killing people and organizing pogroms. That's more of an exception to the rule though, and our trend isn't prone to that. Alexander Arnold is a good guy and saves the standard $50 to $100 per haul for the future. The base of one haul allowed the cowboy to earn a six months wages. In the winter, when cattle are not driven, cowboys received $15 to $20 a month. That's a pittance. Firemen, for example, made 100 a week. A good suit in those days cost 10 bucks, and a ticket to the theater won for life. Cowboys had enough, but, for example, for a revolver costing $50, you had to save up for months. According to official U.S. inflation data, cowboys in terms of modern money earned $400 a month. This is certainly not a bad sum for some poor countries, but we should not forget that for North America it is very, very little. Shoes rarely cost less than a dollar, jeans about two, and 400 grams of coffee were 50 cents. In a month without ferrying, cowboys in general, and our trend in particular, were barely making ends meet. Good thing the need to care for the cattle went nowhere. So, our Alexander Arnold would be provided with a roof over his head and food from his owner Jurgen Klopp for the winter. 
Other cowboys wintered in a similar pattern. So their history, as you now realize, is far from romantic. Well, unless you count the occasional celebration of the end of a haul. A cowboy's job is a hell of a lot of hard work with little sleep and a paycheck ten times less than regular laborers. No duels, gunfights, or epic wars with Indians. Our trend was an ordinary working man whose profession was later romanticized by generations of Americans. That's probably a good thing. See you again, friends. Thanks for watching.